We're in business to save the planet, and we use making clothes to do that. The cure for depression is action. Every one of us has to step up and do what you can according to what your resources are. That was the voice of Patagonia's Yvonne Chouinard, and this is Type 2, a podcast from Looking Sideways, in association with Patagonia that explores the intersection between outdoors, action sports, and activism. Now, in each show, I've been meeting people who are using their passion and involvement with the cultures we all love to create change. We've been discussing the issues they're involved in, the change they're seeking to create, the difficulties involved, and the rewards that follow. Now, this week's guest is Alex Yoda. Alex is a snowboarder who's best known for having one of the greatest turns in the business, as well as the series of thoughtful films he's made in recent years about snowboarding in Turkey and Scotland. Highly recommend that you check those out. Now, it was third time lucky for me and Alex. We had tried to record this episode in Portland in November 2019 and in Niseko in January this year, but we finally got it done by getting on Zoom in August 2020 and taking care of it in time-honoured COVID fashion. And it was great timing because Alex has just launched a new venture called Overview Coffee, which is an ethical take on the coffee distribution game. Now, Overview sources its coffee from farms that prioritise environmental stewardship and is founded upon the principles of regenerative organic agriculture. That's a phrase you're going to hear a lot in this episode. For its proponents, regenerative organic agriculture offers an ethical vision for agriculture based upon a long-term approach to soil health and a commitment to community and environmental sustainability, something which will become increasingly crucial if we're going to solve the many environmental issues we're currently faced with. It's a big topic. It's a very timely topic. And that's the thinking behind Overview, which I think for Alex is a kind of soft power, middle ground, pragmatic take on environmental change. I'm putting words in his mouth there, but that's the conclusion that I drew from our conversation. It's designed to educate people about the whole concept and also encourage them to help create change with the consumer choices they make each week, which let's be honest, and this is also something we discuss in our society, is still how most of us actually get to exercise any influence or power. As you'd expect, if you're a regular listener to Type 2, we also discussed Alex's own story, including his passion for telling snowboarding stories that sit outside the mainstream. And the result is a thoughtful, wide-ranging conversation with plenty of food for thought on different forms of activism and how we have more opportunities to create change than we might think. Good stuff, this one. Thanks, Alex. Really enjoyed it. Hope you do too. Nice one. Alex, how are you? I'm doing great. All things yeah. considered. Yeah. Third time lucky, man. So we met in Portland yeah. last year and we had a little chat then. And then we were going to meet up in Japan, but we didn't manage to do that. Yeah. Um, mainly because I think we were both quite enjoying going snowboarding, which is fair. And also you were on like a super flying visit, weren't you? If I remember rightly, you were you were there like doing some gentum stuff right and it was a real quick turnaround is that what was going on yeah yeah i was there i mean i was in the country for about a month but i was spending about six days in a few different locations so it it was a bit of a whirlwind yeah so we were like okay let's 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 actually let's sit down we'll do it Uh, and here we are so you're in portland and how's portland you got waves tomorrow yeah i'm in portland right now um I split my time between Jackson, Wyoming and Portland Um, and growing up kind of landlocked in Jackson. I kind of take every chance I get to go out to the ocean and and try and surf. So, yeah, Portland's about an hour, hour and a half from the coast. So it's pretty easy just to jet out if there's waves and looks like there's a good little um, swell coming in tomorrow, just like five foot um, with a pretty decent period. So and no wind. So. Yeah, yeah, looks 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 kind of rare. Looks like a rare, um, you know, actually decent forecast. Good good interval. Yeah, <laughs> good <laughs> good winds. Because when Definitely I was there in rare. November, everybody was like, "Yeah, it's pretty windy." <laughs> like, yeah, it's always windy. Yeah, um, and it was just it was just too big for us when we were there, really. But nice, yeah. so you get you get a little uh, late summer swell. Lovely. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, and so have you been mainly in Portland throughout this? I th- let's get the obligatory covid part of the podcast out of the way now yeah. like have you have you been in um have you been in portland for the duration 
No, I've actually mostly been in Jackson. And how's that? Um, it was good. It was it was really interesting. So um, pretty much, let's see, I think it was March 13th or 14th that, um, you know, the resorts closed and, and things sort of started to, the shelter in place uh, orders started to come into place. And um, I was actually out split boarding that day with a friend and, you know, everything just, of course, we heard all the news and how things were kind of evolving and I decided that day that I would just stop snowboarding and and kind of see how things panned out. And um, oh, as in as in you made the decision, sort of almost like civically, you weren't going to snowboard. You you know almost like I'm just going to sit this one out and see. Exactly. Right. Okay. That's quite yeah. A, it's quite a selfless move because that certainly wasn't what a lot of people were saying at the time. Yeah, I mean it's. So, I mean, where I live, it's it's like a very popular tourist destination, but all in all, it's a pretty small community. It's a population of about, you know, 10 to 12,000 people. And so we don't have a very large hospital and, um, you know, ICU unit. If people really need help, then they usually get helicoptered to Idaho or Salt Lake City. Um, so, yeah, it was just a consideration, I think, considering the healthcare workers and, um, you know, sort of these uh adventurous sports that take place in jackson and and the risk associated um and so inevitably when all of the resorts closed then the backcountry got a lot busier and about a week after the resorts closed two people died in avalanches within two days of each other um, wow. okay. and one of the fatalities was a, a a guy named um case who worked for my dad my dad has a restaurant near the ski resort um oh. so it was yeah it was just like really evident that it was really important that people be careful you know it's always important yeah. to be careful and kind of have your wits about you in the back country but um i feel like this situation kind of called for an extra um acknowledgement of refrain right yeah yeah, sorry to hear that. So, that, like, immediately something that hit home pretty close. Yeah, definitely. And how was the rest of um, the time then? Did you just because well, obviously you've got a huge project that you've been working on, which you know we'll get to in a second. So, um, but did you settle into a pretty pretty decent routine? I mean, it's not a bad place to be uh, to be locked down, is it really? No, I mean Jackson is very insulated from the world's problems in a lot of ways. Um, so it's, it's not a bad place to be really ever. Um, but it was really interesting because it was the first time in my life that I would wake up in the winter, totally able-bodied, not injured, and there'd be fresh snowfall and I wouldn't be excited. You know, I would look outside and be like, oh, it snowed. It's just like over the years of just being completely obsessed with powder and, and like going out to the mountain and just sort of like cutting off that artery and, and seeing you know life or what i'd be up to that day in a different way was a different experience how did you find that because i think that's been one i think like the incongruity of those experiences has been one of the really difficult things for people to get used to hasn't it you, you know the fact that even on that level the life that you used to is no longer available to you you know that's that's yeah. and that's clearly like a, at the soft end of that when you compare to you know what's what people are dealing with globally right now but you know it's real isn't it like that that kind of disconnect did was that yeah some do you do you, do you work it well in that sort of in those constraints i i think i do i i guess i have a lot of interests and i'm sort of weary of obsession and over the years I'd like you know snowboarding's kind of been my primary pursuit and in that and being pretty singularly focused in that, I've, I've realized that there's a lot else out there and other things to you know pay attention to and, and kind of sink my teeth into. And so, whether it's you know starting a business or um, photography or other interests that I have, I, I just sort of you know felt like I was in a pre pretty like privileged position actually to be able to think of, you know okay I can't go snowboarding that's the thing I usually do now what should I focus my time on? You know, the, there's a certain um, implied comfort level that is really fortunate in that sense and being able just to, 
sit down and, you know, I, I built a website. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, that's something I hadn't done before. So if yeah. you've ever built a website, you can understand that's pretty time consuming. Um, yeah. But yeah. From like a mental health perspective, I, I just like got more into yoga and, and meditation and things of that sort that I would kind of find in snowboarding. Like that's, I think the reason that I am so addicted to snowboarding is that it's like a moving meditation and you're out there and you're, you know, existing within this natural environment and you just have to be in the moment. And, um, it's easier when there's motion involved for me. And so trying to just like find that in stillness has been a interesting pursuit. Right. And how, how have you found that? Cause again, that's not an easy thing to, you know, it's one thing to say, isn't it? But to, to accomplish is another thing entirely. It's hard. Yeah. You know, like just sit, I, I think I have a pretty, um, calm exterior but a very active mind and so that idea of just sitting comfortably and and letting the thoughts pass is it's definitely been a bit, bit of a um uphill battle for me but but a good one you know like there's i've been using the headspace app a bit which i think right. is pretty great the guy's voice actually sounds a bit like your voice so, I, so i've I been told you. that a few times <laughs> <laughs> really i got a fr- i got a friend of mine who said to me you know listen He's like, listen to your podcast and listen to the Headspace app. And I think it's something about, <laughs> he said, he's um, from New Zealand. He said he found it very soothing. I was like, very right, soothing. okay, maybe I should chill it out a little bit yeah. more. Um, great. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I've talked about a lot on the show and, and generally is, you know, having the time to do these things, they kind of, during this period, like, they, they are just indications of class and privilege, aren't they, really? You know, we're yeah. very, very fortunate. Because I've been the same as you, really. You know, I'm in a really privileged position. I was able to use the time that I suddenly had all that. I don't have kids, so suddenly I had all this extra time, you know, which I was able to sort of channel into, you know, fairly self-indulgent pursuits at the end of the day. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like been, it's, it's one of the interesting ways this is, this is develops, isn't it? You know, these new indications of, of class and, and and privilege that it's revealed really you know um but your project which is uh overview coffee right um, yeah is so they, this is something that we talked about when we met last year in portland which was november i believe and you know i think you were like heavily in the planning stages but it hadn't actually launched then had it no it hadn't we actually just launched two weeks ago right so presumably you were able to use that that time and focus to to really go all in on on this project then right oh yeah honestly it was like a blessing in disguise in in some ways because i just got to focus all of my energy on developing the business and you know instead of spending a few hours a day on it and a few hours a day on the mountain i was just spending all day on the on the business yeah so it's uh it's it's a well I'll, I'll, maybe if you explain it it's a it's a coffee lot distribution business is that essentially what it is uh yeah i mean it's it's a coffee company so we're roasting whole bean coffee and and selling it um and the name is overview which comes from the overview effect uh which is explained as a um, cognitive shift in awareness that astronauts experience when they see earth from space um and there's some amazing quotes out there from astronauts talking about how, you know, borders disappear and it's just this ball of life that's sort of hanging in this endless void of darkness. Yeah, well, and, it's epitomized by Earthrise, isn't it? That photo, you know, which is like the Apollo, the classic Apollo 8 sort of, um, I mean, I was actually reading something about this earlier in prep for this and I think it's not National Geographic. It's like, you know, the, the, the greatest photograph ever taken, but you know, like your, the fact you've named it after that effect and there's quite a, I can't, you, you'll, you'll be able to say what the wording is of almost like the mission statement, which is on, uh, of the business, but clearly that you've got pretty, um, lofty goals for this, you know, with, with, with it, like, cause you're, you know, you're connecting it to this global earth care conversation basically, aren't you? in, in yeah. the name and the ethos so can you expand upon what the thinking behind that a little bit 
Yeah, definitely. So the the thing that's significant about the overview effect is it really sort of initiated the environmental movement. And, you know, having that cognitive shift in awareness brought back this new perspective on how we exist on this planet and sort of what it all means. And in, in consideration of, you know, how important biodiversity is and how there is this sort of, you know, human pursuit of ultimate you know, species supremacy, where we just continue down this path of building and growing and technology and, and in the process. And I think it's mostly a symptom of capitalism. We sort of forget our place in all of it and that we actually ex exist with all of it. And we're not in control of how the planet works. Um, and that's, that's essentially where, you know, I feel like I got to and an, at a place in my head where I understood that to a degree, where I started to have these sort of thoughts around like, why do we try to control everything on this planet? Why aren't we more considerate of, um, you know, the lives of trees and other animals? And um, well, it's a it's a growth at all costs ethos, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. it's um, it's uh, well, it's 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 even more explicit than that. It's it's tying economic well-being to growth at all costs. I mean, that is fundamentally the ethos of capitalism, isn't it? Which, which is it? Let's be frank. Of a, a recent thing, you know, people have people have obviously always um, there's always been growth clearly in the history of humanity, but it's only really post-industrial revolution that it's it's been quite so rapacious. Let's say where you know where it has actually accelerated um environmental catastrophe let's let's say um so how does your how does you, what 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 is it about your business then like what how how do you position the the coffee like overview in in the context of that yeah so basically when i started learning about regenerative agriculture regenerative organic agriculture um it was a completely new concept to me and I had worked on a farm in Idaho for a summer and it's a biodynamic organic farm called cosmic apple and great name. Yeah. Great name for sure. <laughs> um, and it's this awesome family. Um, and they just run the farm and, and they have this work share program where you can go over and you can basically work in exchange for food. And, you know, I went over there and I just spent a lot of time working on the farm and kind of seeing how things work. And over time, I started to be more conscious about what I put in my body. Like as a kid, I just ate sugary cereal and like Eggo waffles with corn syrup, maple syrup, you know, like yeah, awful. But I just had this crazy sweet tooth and candy is all I wanted. And And then as I kind of grew up and started learning about, you know, the dairy industry, the meat industry, all these things, how humans are the only animals that, you know, drink another animal's milk or use it and i just started to really question how the american diet worked for me you know as a quote-unquote athlete um and i when i would whenever i'd get injured i would just change my diet to vegan to like be completely anti-inflammatory um and so just having like these considerations in my mind and, and spending time on that farm and seeing like the work that actually goes into growing food um, and then starting to understand like the reason that those processes have been industrialized and mechanized to feed all of the, you know, billions of humans on this planet. Um, there's just this disconnect, you know, it's this factory concept put into a natural environment. Um, and it's, it just, it just doesn't work. So, you know, as I started to learn more about agriculture and, and its follies and these potential solutions meanwhile learning a lot about climate change and what is causing it there's this amazing intersection between like what's wrong with agriculture and how that's affecting our climate on a large scale and what we can do with agriculture to actually counteract that effect which is a definition of regenerative organic agriculture, essentially. So using the process to mitigate, because you know you 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 linked you linked the the, 
the, the damage, if you like, to um, to the environment, but also as you referred to earlier, it's like it's an in, it, it's damaging to individuals as well, right? Because it's it, it promotes a way of eating which and a way of and a, a form of consumption which is actually also leading to like huge health issues, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Um, so right, so yeah, that experience and and the learning that you've done has kind of led you to to this understanding of different ways of, of producing that can help to mitigate these these factors right so yeah. is that what's is that the, what's behind overview then it's a regenerative organic agriculture concept yeah so essentially i just i started thinking about okay if if i'm going to get engaged with agriculture like what is an agricultural product that people really have an emotional connection to because i think in order to create real change we kind of have to hit people where it hurts you know like things that are significant in their lives um not a lot of people really relate to a polar bear unfortunately you know that's something that's kind of out of sight out of mind for most of us um, but coffee is something that people drink every single morning and are definitely addicted to and ritualize yeah so completely. i started doing research around um coffee and how it's being affected by climate change and it's actually you know one of the most vulnerable crops based on where it grows um, okay so can you so, explain a little bit about how in what way so yeah coffee grows um basically in subtropical regions in the mountains in an area called the bean belt which is essentially about 25 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator um so it kind of wraps around the center of the earth um, and that's why, you know, coffee go, grows all around the world, but only in those specific latitudes. So, you know, coffee originated in Africa and then was cultivated around the world um, by, you know, kind of farmers and, and international trade kind of way back in the day. Um, but these areas essentially, so there's this perfect climate where great coffee grows. It's a lot like wine, like there's terroir, right? Yeah. And as the planet warms, as the like the average temperature rises, the actual land that is suitable to grow coffee rises as well. And, and we know how mountains are shaped. Sure. You know? <laughs> so it just is less and less land over time that can actually cultivate coffee. OK, right. So it's almost getting squeezed out with, yeah. with all the with all the attendant issues. Exactly. That arise from that. So before we get into the details of, of that. So were you almost looking for a vehicle to, to practice these ideas? Because it kind of sounds like you're, you're, you know, like the research, the interest, the understanding of the, of the bigger picture, like the damage that ag traditional agricultural methods can, can cause, like we've said on these different levels. Were you, were you looking for a vehicle to ex explore alternative ways and coffee was the right one? 100%. Right. Um, presumably you like a coffee then as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I, I, I think it's fair to say that most people that start a coffee company come from, you know, this love of coffee or this interest in, um, well, you used the word ritualistic, yeah. didn't you? Which was perfect because, you know, we could all recognize that. Yeah. hundred. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, for me, like I didn't have a coffee background at all. Like I, I, I've always loved the smell of it. Like when I was a kid, I would wake up early and make coffee for my parents because I like loved the process and the smell, but I actually didn't start drinking coffee until a couple of years ago. Um, cause I'm like really sensitive to caffeine and, um, but I, I had to sort of like harden a little bit and <laughs> like yeah. get used to drinking coffee because now we, we taste a lot of different coffees and, yeah. um, so, but yeah, no, it was it was much more sort of an operational activism approach to starting a business versus, you know, a, a real passion for the product that I've developed the passion for the product, but I really am coming into it from an environmental perspective. So you mentioned earlier that you feel to make change, you need to hit people with something that they that they like, you know, um, and yeah, you know, people do fetishize products like coffee, don't they? You know, they become they become something more than the actual product. You know, we we create a culture around it in the West that's not really to do with where it comes from. And you could say the same for 
for, for the way we consume most things really they you know they develop an iconography they develop a, a value don't they but which often has nothing to do with the, the the reality of you know like if you look at coffee as you've described um what's happening in those growing regions isn't often part of the conversation when it comes to coffee in the west let's put it that way you know what what is part of it is what it symbolizes um the ritualistic way of preparing it so you try to connect those dots essentially is that is that the goal to like give make people in in the same way that often you know with the wider conversation it's about changing the disconnect i think you used that word disconnect earlier about the way we consume and how things are made yeah exactly yeah and and when you look at the coffee industry and i've definitely dove pretty deep into it a lot of the marketing is either this is the best tasting coffee kind of on a specialty scale or on the more commodity scale this is caffeine and it's fuel for your day yeah and there's very little discussion around the environment there's a lot of discussion actually in specialty coffee around the livelihoods of farmers which is awesome um, and there's a lot of really great projects out there that are happening like we're not super unique in the sense of being a, a coffee company that's trying to do good there are a few um, but our positioning is much different in terms of the farms we're engaging with the the mission and just our, our reason for being it's exactly to interact with and um, cultivate and actually spread regenerative organic agriculture around the world in these places that are so incredibly vulnerable to climate change. So how do you define regenerative organic agriculture? My easiest definition of it is just logical agriculture. Like the thing that just blows my mind is that we would use, you know, material that we use in bombs to fertilize our soil. You know, there's there's all of these techniques that are being used on farmland that are just so outrageously illogical from a health standpoint. Um, it's very short term gains, right? So monocropping systems just try to grow as much product as possible without considering how nutritious it is. And the point of us eating food is, is to nourish our bodies, right? And so if you're eating these empty calories, essentially, and just filling your gut and then expelling it, it doesn't really benefit you in any way. And a lot of the, the farmland that we actually cultivate is just to feed animals so we can eat the animals. You know, it's like the, the, the meat industry, I think it takes six times um, the amount of calories that like you'd get out of a steak. Like the, the cow would eat six times that's that amount of calories in uh, feed um to give you a steak and, and so it's sort of this like degenerative system where we put more in and get less out um and so in, re in a regenerative system it's about really acknowledging the biodiversity and, and how there is this very beautiful interconnectedness of all of the life forms so like people I, I wish there was a more clear understanding of, of the difference between soil and dirt, right? Dirt is essentially dead soil. So soil is full of life. I mean, there's, there's fungi, there's all of these bacteria, and it's a lot like our gut, actually. So since it's teeming with life and healthy soil, it's providing this amazing environment for, for things to grow. But then when we go through and we till that soil, we basically kill it and we turn it into dirt. And then we're forced to put all of these um, extra, you know, fertilizers and things back into the dirt to try to bring it back to life. But it's sort of a robotic life or a synthetic life. Yeah, which is which is the, the approach, right? So I'm going to use the word traditional, which is kind of, sorry, conventional, not traditional, conventional um, agricultural means. Like, yeah, just to basically strip the land for yields. Yeah. And then not really um, pay any mind to the consequences and just just move on. And you know, obviously that has calamitous environmental effects, right? Um, presumably, some of which you've experienced in the in the course of of you know getting the the company up and running. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I mean, regenerative organic agriculture is it's really 
I mean, I, I hate to use the term silver bullet. You know, it's not necessarily that because it takes a lot of work, but it's amazing because it sort of solves two problems at once, right? Like food insecurity is a really big thing on this planet and climate change is a really serious issue. And so there's this thing called regenerative organic agriculture that we can use that grows more nutritious crops and in the same, if not more quantity than a monocropping system. And it supports like way more forms of life and it, and it doesn't kind of destruct these systems that we consider somewhat invisible. Unless you're an ecologist, you don't really understand like the importance of bird migration or bees or, you know, these different bac- bacteria in the soil. And, and well, like you said, and, like soil health, like the yeah. things that actually lead to a healthy ecosystem, basically. Exactly. But what happens is, you know, we, we sort of we have these short sighted things where we go in and we log a whole forest and we're inconsiderate of the fact that we're tearing down homes for thousands of migratory birds. And those birds are actually fertilizing that soil, you know, because they come in and they actually eat the bugs off of the plants. And so in like a agroforestry, regenerative, organic coffee growing system, you don't need to utilize pesticides and herbicides to keep bugs off of the plants because there's a there's an upper tree canopy where migratory birds come through and they fly down and they eat the bugs and then they like poop and that fertilizes the soil and it's a the circle of life right it's the system yeah. that yeah is, yeah yeah well is, it's it, it's it's it, it works doesn't it exactly <laughs> i mean yeah and like i was saying earlier it's only relatively recently that we've so dramatically moved away from that and managed to cause so much damage in such a short space of time yeah i mean in in there's some fairly sort of um apocalyptic apocalyptic predictions as well right in this whole conversation you know when i was researching this some pretty crazy facts and figures flying around as you know as if like people saying things like if we don't adopt this practice then that you know within a within a matter of decades like we won't actually have workable soil left you know in in certain areas and the other thing that's kind of quite mind-blowing about this as well is like there's already like a very very famous example of what happens to soil if you don't um if you aren't mindful of the way that you farm, which is the dust bowl essentially. Mm-hmm. And you know, that, that was a, well, like a decade long drought in the, in the Midwest, which essentially destroyed all the topsoil on the great plains, which was whipped up into huge dust storms, which did lead to a greater understanding in the States of like the importance of soil health and led to like federal intervention because they saw the effects because you know you did have like um effectively what you would now call climate change refugees like you know the Jode family and grapes of wrath were essentially climate change refugees caused by that you know huge ecological disaster so there is a there is a very very culturally famous example of what happens if you don't if you aren't mindful of this it seems incredible really that this is almost spoken about as a as a revolutionary approach or even something that is worthy of argument because you know clearly not only you know not only is it a, is it a logical case to make but there's evidence of what happens if you don't if you don't make it essentially um so in your in your field that you've chosen and, and in the area like what practical things you know because it's obviously such an umbrella term isn't it like what i, I mean regenerative organic agriculture so what what practical things are you actually doing like to to try and change what's happening in the in the regions you're working in i mean essentially a lot of the work we're doing right now is more on the consumer facing side in terms of getting people to acknowledge these practices and seek them out Um, and patagonia is doing a lot of work on that end as well with their regenerative organic cotton and mangoes and um, pedagon provisions and the rodale institute um which is awesome. The, the Rodale Institute has essentially been the, um, you know, the, the governing body of doing research around regenerative organic and regenerative organic. And they've had an ongoing study that's 40 years old with a conventional farm next to a regenerative organic farm. And they're studying the yield differences and the soil health differences and all these things. And it's a really amazing resource. They're, they're 
they're sort of yeah the like the leading authority on all of this work um and so that they with patagonia and dr bronner's and a few other brands have um, developed a new certification called the regenerative organic certification and it will be a certifying body to, like organic or fair trade or climate neutral um, that you'll start seeing on products um, and it's the most cohesive um, certification for any agricultural product there is right now so it's um, almost like harnessing that consumer power to well, in, yeah. in, ter in terms of the choices because you know like facts about it is and there's a quote on one of the recent videos i was watching you know three times a day we make a choice about the type of world mm -hmm. we want to live in by what totally. we eat essentially exactly. um and i think people forget the, the incredible power that comes with that in terms of how you can change behavior so so is that what you mean when you say it's like almost like educating the consumer and, and this and you know the program that you've just outlined it's almost like saying to people like you you, you can make a choice that's gonna um, promote this by what you eat and the choices that you make yeah exactly yeah and i kind of walked around your question but the that that side of things it is you know this sort of vote with your dollars kind of mentality where we're in this capitalist system that's working against us. So we need to create as much leverage as we can to work against it and utilize it for good. Right. So if, if we can spend money on the things that we truly believe in and, you know, like for me, that's the intention with starting a business. I don't necessarily want to be like on the computer all day and sending emails <laughs> and stuff like that. But, but I'm, I'm really interested in the, the power of capitalism for good and creating leverage for systems like this with something that has so many users like coffee like there's billions of people that drink coffee around the world so if you know hopefully a large percentage of those or even a small percentage of those can create a lot of change and when people start to realize and be more conscious and, and you've seen a trend in this anyway and people are just more and more conscious of you know what does this actually mean when they're reading the ingredients in the food that they eat? You know, what is this yeah. scientific sounding word? Um, and with that sort of rise in consciousness, I think we are able to actually create real positive change around agricultural systems and therefore the health of our planet. Well, it's a pragmatic approach to activism, isn't it? Because as you say, we are in a system that does exist and it is a challenge to change behavior. You know, it's a pretty obvious thing to say, but, um, you know, you use the example of like polar bears earlier, but I think the point is you need to make, you need people to make an emotional connection, don't you? Yeah. Um, to get them to make a change. Unfortunately, you know, you would hope it would be nice if you could just outline the reasons and, you know, expect people to understand why we need to make a change. But the reality is you do need this emotional connection and you do need, to give people a reason to buy into it don't you and that is a it is effective isn't it you know like the, it is in that history of activism like uh, helping to change consumer patterns is effective it does work and like you say if you can you know close the disconnect which is which is really the challenge on a lot of levels with this debate isn't it you know getting people to think about how their behavior like the consequences of that behavior and you know whether it's at the farmer in a country that you never think about or even your own body you know like those are powerful motives aren't they to try and get people to change definitely yeah and, and it's you know it's this just idea of, of thinking more logically about how we eat what we eat and like you said it's this decision that you make three times a day and I think it's crazy that I can go to the grocery store in Wyoming in the middle of February and buy mangoes and avocados and yeah. pineapples. You know, it's just there's there's a way that we can exist with the seasons. And I mean, it's ironic to say that because there's in, in no way possible that coffee will ever be local in most of the places where people drink it. Right. Like most coffee is exported to the quote unquote developed world uh, where it, it cannot grow. Um, so there's certain <laughs> levels of, uh, you know, globalization that we are so used to that I think it's potentially not possible or not feasible to consider, you know, sort of um, working our way out of, of those uh, niceties. 
but um, yeah well that's like we say so the, that that is how we live and you can't yeah i think one of the things i'm really learning from doing this podcast and from speaking to people about their activism and about their ideas is is this need to persuade the middle ground you know it's quite a constant theme really um about this debate and you know unfortunately there's this, there's a place for f- for more robust activism obviously but in terms of actually creating large systemic change you d- you do need to persuade the people whose lives are going to be effective in a lot of ways negatively and you know persuading them in a constructive way is 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 a very necessary tool of activism i'm i'm believing the more i do this and the more i have conversations like this really yeah no i totally agree i I think it's like looking at the tools that were utilized to get us into the mess and utilizing those same tools to get us out of it right like if if money is the pursuit if wealth is the pursuit then we need to show and make a very clear case that more money can be made for doing it like by doing it the right way yeah and that it doesn't necessarily mean the end of the the life that you're used to it's just but your choices can make that difference and you know can have a positive outcome essentially yeah exactly in terms of your personal activism you know one of the you know you mentioned snowboarding obviously you're a snowboarder um and you know you're one of the things you've really done with your snowboarding career is tell stories as well you know, through the films that you've made, through the places that you've traveled to. Uh, did that influence this? Because you're quite used to seeking out these alternative narratives, I guess is my point, in a, in a pretty homogenized culture. You know, you look at something like snowboarding and yeah, it's, it's pretty Western, it's pretty white, but you've you've definitely gone out of your way to find alternative ways of telling the story of snowboarding. So did that did that kind of influence this approach to finding... Because what you found here is another story, isn't it? It's another another cultural story, essentially. Um, is is did, did did are they connected in any way? Yeah, I think it'd be impossible to say that they that they aren't. And yeah, I think over time, you know, I, I was so as a youth, I was so obsessed with snowboarding and snowboarding videos, and you know, the robot food era was like my era, and that's what I grew up on, and. And the way that I perceive snowboarding, you know, it's just like this fun thing that you do and it's incredible and you get to be with your friends and outside and, you know, kind of push your limits and, and try these things that you can only dream of. And, and the more I sort of, you know, became a part of it, the more it felt like you're saying homogenized and it's just every year it's sort of this redundant routine of the videos coming out at the same time and then you're excited about it and then you watch them and then it's all action and then the year goes by again and repeat right and so i was sort of in that world for a little while and after a couple of injuries started to you know scale back on the pursuit and in that sense of like making a video part you know and I, i don't ever feel like i made a great video part but that's okay like i've i've become comfortable with that fact <laughs> but that's one of the great but, things about getting old you get comfortable with a lot of those things yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, i don't have to worry but, about that anymore and that feels really good exactly i mean yeah. that was the craziest thing is like it dawned on me that i was going out there and i was doing all this work for like a whole day to build a jump and then come out the next day and like so stressed the whole night barely sleep and come out there and then it's all this fear and anxiety and you're setting up the jump you're trying to figure out how fast to go and then at the end of it, like the thing that you're trying to get is a three second video clip that will pass by like in the snap finger in a movie with like a few thousand other three second video clips. Well, and also let's be honest as well, the position you were in, you and it was it's, it was marketing, you know, you were selling something. Oh yeah. Like yeah, and that, that sure. and that you know, so like that that is you know, if you're a thinking person, like there's there's that's only there's only so long you can do that without thinking like, what is this all about, really? <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, and that's kind of why I brought it up because obviously you channeled your um, privileged position into finding 
telling stories that are a little bit you know shining light on these cultural pockets of 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 the same world that just hadn't really been told before totally so is that is that how it happened you kind of like thought you know what i've got to try and find something a little bit more with a little bit more substance here yeah no exactly so i actually saw the absinthe film 12 and there's a segment where they went to turkey and and they were heli boarding in turkey and then there's this maybe five second clip of them riding with these local guys on these planks of wood and i'd never seen it before and it just you know started stirring up my my brain and and i did as much research as i could but i really couldn't find much on this like board riding culture in turkey um but i knew it existed and i kind of knew where it would exist and and so i started connecting some dots and we ended up in turkey and i think it was 2016 um yeah and and just Honestly, it was crazy because all I had was this one guy named Ishmael who I was talking to on Facebook and, and he had a friend who was studying this snowboarding culture in university. And then his other friend was an English professor and, and could be our translator and everything just sort of fell into place. Um, and fortunately, Patagonia was interested in, in funding a project like that, you know, and they're kind of a unique case in, in the outdoor sports uh, industry where they are interested in these stories that are a little bit more outside of the sort of normal content that is created. And, um, they put a lot of faith in me to go over there and, and, you know, I brought my buddy's work shirt and, and Nick Russell and, um, we were really winging it and we got so lucky, you know, the, the story really fell into our laps in a sense where one, we got great conditions, but we met really amazing people and there's like this welcoming feeling it was it was weird like i'd never been to that part of the world um there'd recently been a a terrorist attack on the blue mosque in istanbul um and so there's a little bit of tension you know going out there and and just you know it's the furthest from home i've ever felt um but i'd never felt more welcome and kind of more excited to be in a place that I'd never been. Um, and and it was a very explorative experience and kind of went there, you know, to make a documentary, but without a screenplay or script, you know, we wanted to find this culture and just sort of see what it offered. And, and the story unfolded in this way of, you know, a, a sort of metaphor for what's happening around the world where there's this old culture of craftsmanship. Like these people is a logging community. And in order to, you know, have fun, they started riding these planks of wood around because it snowed so much. And it was just like this toy, right? And it was completely recreational and and nothing logical to it. Um, but over time, as you know, the internet and, and, and like modern culture sort of started to invade these mountain towns now the 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 children of these guys whose you know great grandfathers were writing these planks of wood now like the great great grandsons are on youtube watching videos of like what's (laughs) going on in the city and like you know they want to move to istanbul and like go to clubs you know (laughs) and so yeah it's just these these craftsmanship cultures are just sort of you know disintegrating yeah and it's just such a brilliant you know for, for, for snowboarding it's just a great fundamentally it's just a great story isn't it you know like the whole because we're so obsessed with like tracking the history of of these things and you know where did it come from and who's the first and you know it's just something really beautiful about the fact like you said there's just this little community in the middle of asia minor who would like gloriously untouched by any considerations of like you know the things we obsess about in relation to sliding down a hill you know all the silliness really and for them it's just a joyous thing isn't it which really came across in the film as well like it was it it was it was so great to see like just how much of a part of that very localized culture it was and how even though like culturally what you were doing and what they were doing well sorry physically what you were doing and what they were doing is obviously related culturally so far apart you know but but there was that there was that bond and empathy anyway you know it was it was, it was really great yeah and i can i can understand like why that experience probably stuck with you because you know you travel to those places 
with a snowboard and yeah you know you can you have a choice don't you again you can try and find those slightly more interesting stories if you've got the position you've got or you could go back to utah and build another jump you know like which is what everyone's been doing for 30 years so <laughs> I, it, you know it's it's nice to sort of see those those different tales and and to sort of give them give them more of a platform right yeah so have yeah. you got any more have you got any more on the go got any um, more projects like that i mean we 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 followed that one up with the um the film in scotland about yeah, the right to right Rome. to Rome. yeah um which was actually just the following year and, and that was a great experience and how we met through our mutual friend lauren mccallum and yeah of course. um is just such a legend and like, yeah if she hadn't come up to us in that bar and just started chatting us up like, like that movie wouldn't have been what it was at all um so big yeah because you, you you very definitely didn't get good conditions on that trip no for sure <laughs> <laughs> scotland was it was great you know like the the poor conditions that we got were amazing yeah and and so that again that story seemed like it unfolded as it as it went you know you've mentioned lauren kind of you know you met lauren and then if you watch the film right to rome you can see you can see that in the film but it, that was one of those ones where you didn't really have an idea of what you were going to get but you got a story out of it in the end exactly so what was appealing about that story so you know it was another interesting metaphor i thought when i i actually just wanted to go to scotland because i i saw this book that was sort of um i think it was like the 50 strangest ski destinations in the world or, or something like that and i i looked and i saw this page that like had this cliff band that kind of looked like Wyoming and it was um Nevis Range in Scotland it was the back quarries and yeah and uh I was like wow that's hilarious and so I I just pitched it to Patagonia and as you know the way I pitched it was it's the least romantic ski destination in the world <laughs> I'm, I'm only <laughs> and, laughing because get, get your hate mail in everyone <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty fair to say that usually the weather in Scotland is is not the most welcoming uh, or comfortable. I mean, I'm about to tap my hardwood desk to, uh, yeah, it's it's certainly icy over there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Scotland, Scotland, you know, again, though, it's a, it's a, it, it's just, as you obviously discovered and, and what comes across in the film, it's just, it's just not even about the hill, is it really? You know, it's about the culture that comes with it. It's about the experience totally. of being there and you know i've i've had some of the best times i've ever had on a snowboard in scotland with the worst snow you know yeah and again it's just it's just worth remembering isn't it but you yeah. also found the whole right to rome story which you know is is obviously of interest as well linked as it is to land rights and access and you know um the unique situation we have over here in terms of access and land rights yeah, exactly. So it's something that we had researched a little bit before we went, but then when we met Laura and she really explained it to us, how it works, how it's publicly perceived and utilized. And essentially what it means is legal trespassing. Like all of the land, even if it's privately owned, can be utilized by the public um, for accessing the mountains, which is so different than what I was used to growing up in the States where private property is private property. And in a lot of states, if you come onto someone's private property unannounced, or uninvited, you can actually be shot. You know, that's legal. Um, so that was something that was really compelling to me because it seemed like this country had just opened up for the sake of recreation. But it's funny because it's, or it's not funny, but it, it's, it's just interesting to me because it's more of a consequence of most of the land being privately held by a very yeah. small number of people. So it's it's almost like this contingency where it's like, well, you can never own land really because it's all it's all owned and not really for sale or attainable, but you can use it sometimes. Yeah. You know, so I think it's this interesting thing where in, in the States we feel like we have so much protected land, all these national parks and wilderness and, and um, Bureau of Land Management land that we get to use for recreation. But we are also in like a much bigger country. So the percentages aren't that different of, right. you know, private land to protected land sure. um, and with our current administration that protected land seems to be shrinking smaller and right. smaller 
um, and being sold to, to private interests. So yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. One of the, one of the um, consequences of of the current s- situation actually in the UK. I'm talking very specifically. I'm talking about COVID, but um, yeah. you know, with uh, because everyone's been locked down for so long, and and no one can travel. So basically, everybody's um, going in the UK. And what what what's interesting is like we're so used to like not being allowed on land, especially in England and Wales because you know it's considered to be private and that that social construct which obviously i completely disagree with and everybody wishes it was more like scotland to be honest has been kind of thrown out the window and what you found is like people are wild camping people are kind of ignoring those laws um and but yeah people really don't like it you know like it's and it's again it's quite a class thing over here it's quite linked to you know because obviously land ownership is linked to wealth and and privilege again so the idea that you've got people who've been locked up in flats suddenly decide they want to go and visit the countryside or the seaside or whatever and go camping and they don't really give a shit about what the rules are is is definitely causing an interesting debate over here right now um i don't think anything will particularly change from it but yeah it's just been one of those kind of funny consequences of the situation really where you know as we were saying at the beginning those social contracts that you used to kind of being rewritten a little bit be interesting to see how long it lasts right and how permanent it is yeah i mean there's there's this element to it where you know jackson where i grew up it's we're experiencing the busiest summer we ever have and it's a place that's used to a massive influx of tourism every summer every winter and then there's these just like dead shoulder seasons Right. Um, and this summer, because I think the theme parks are closed, you know, there's no Disneyland. There's no, yeah, exactly. Eggs, there's no concerts to go to. So people are visiting the national parks with, which is awesome. You know, like there's, there's always this funny debate in the outdoors when things get a little bit crowded and people get eggy about it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's such a, like a weird headspace, I think, because you're upset about someone doing the thing that you like to do you know so it's this this concept of like yeah i really like to <laughs> I, I like to be out there alone though it's mine and it's not anyone's it's all of ours right yeah i completely and, agree i mean it's epitomized by localism isn't it you know yeah like, exactly like no you can't you can't come and do this like this is my thing um, yeah you know this is my wilderness you know i i completely agree there's just something fundamentally silly and elitist about that i think personally yeah the caveat being that typically if you do actually live there then you have this propensity to actually consider its protection and not litter or not leave your human waste on or near the trail you know there's there's certain sort of um habits i think that we form by spending a lot of time in the outdoors that that's definitely true yeah coming from the city they're just not like as attuned to how you interact with that environment so yeah there's like there's a heavier impact based on experience so i think there's just a lot of necessity for educating those populations even in school you know like i wish i wish our educational system was like okay this is how here's like baseline economics how to like not get stuck in debt Here's like how to be emotionally available <laughs> and vulnerable and talk about your feelings. And like, yeah. here's how to interact with the natural world in a way that you can, you know, actually have a positive impact versus a degenerative one. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, again, localism is a perfect sort of metaphor for it because, you know, you can shout at people or you can educate them. Yeah. You know, they, they're not going anywhere. They're going to come back. You know, totally. And you can either explain to them what the what the you know like the way that everybody's in that part of in that environment has collectively agreed to behave for the greater good or you can scream at them and threaten them with violence you know which has never worked (laughs) no Um, it's worked in surfing to some degree and and you know that's the the technique that's been utilized to make sure that there's some sort of law and order and and critical waves and you know yeah of course that that, that, but yeah there are there are but it's like education is always better i mean clearly you know yeah. it's just a fairly yeah. self-evident truth isn't it whatever the totally whatever the conversation but yeah it's interesting i totally and you know your point is about behavior is obviously 
yeah i mean that's that's huge, clearly a huge part of the debate in the uk as well you know like what are people do and these people are behaving in this way but you know for me it's just fascinating because we're talking about and i say we as in collectively in our industry that we're all part of you know we're talking about access and diversity a lot of the minute and we're talking about you know who has the right to enter these spaces and you know like it's interesting seeing the reaction when people that aren't used to being in those spaces and people aren't used to seeing in those spaces like that that's that's a very interesting part of the debate right now isn't it and yeah. uh and like like you say i think it behoves us to to just help educate and facilitate that really doesn't it yeah yeah i think it's it's this really destructive mentality around ownership or um what's the word i'm looking for like um oh, i'm totally blanking right now well it's like a proprietorial aspect to it isn't there you know this idea that this is this is our thing you know like and and but the question should be like who do these things belong to and how do you how do you decide that you know and i think we're all very used to deciding it in a certain way and that's kind of changing right now isn't it yeah yeah and i think there's this really destructive level of entitlement that exists right where people just feel like what's available to everyone is is theirs personally um and I just think that gets into this narrative that has probably caused a lot more problems than we physically experience. Um, yeah. And the, it, it kind of comes back to like that idea of biodiversity, right? Where we are just part of this whole and we exist on this planet. We breathe the air, but the air is filtered by trees. So shouldn't we value the tree's life as much as our own, right? Like if we believe that it's water and sunlight that grows plants, shouldn't we then just inherently believe that, the teeming life in the soil and the fungal networks that trees use to communicate. Should we just believe in all of that and consider it just as a, just as important as the air that we need to breathe and the water that we need to drink to survive, right? And the sunlight that we need to absorb through our skin and the vitamins we get from that. Like, can't we have this perspective around our existence that is cohesive and inclusive of the things that we can't talk to. We can talk, well, you can talk to your plants if you want to, or the, the forest, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like the, the interaction is not, you know, the language that we're used to. It's, it's a completely different language and one that we don't quite understand. And, and the funny thing, this, that book that I sent you, the, the one straw revolution, yeah right i'm gonna read that masanobu fukuoka yeah it's it's amazing and he makes this hilarious point where he's like the most uh important discovery of science is the discovery of how little we know you know and it's the great irony as well it's like the the human race has tried to figure out all of like sort of this like pretty high-minded pursuit of like we can figure this out nature yeah we got this we can figure this thing out we can understand it and control it when that's just not a reality or you know a noble pursuit because it doesn't need to be figured out it just needs to be carefully acknowledged and understood to the degree that is not detrimental to the like the greater good right yeah well which is another absolutely horrifying slash fascinating angle on the the corona covid situation isn't it for sure yeah which is probably another podcast really <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll say we'll save that for round four yeah um yeah no alex that was great thank you man i knew i knew, I knew thank you a good one once we finally once we finally got into it yeah um i'm very jealous of your your surf mission tomorrow so get some for me i i sadly oh. don't have any waves over here in the uk but um but yeah, look forward to uh, catch something in person soon, man. Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much. Yeah, no worries. So there you go. That was me in conversation with Alex Yoder, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about the whole Overview project, then you can find them over at Overview Coffee on Instagram, while Alex is at Yoda Yoda at the same destination. You should also watch Alex's films, Foothills and The Right to Rome, which I strongly recommend. You can find those on the Patagonia YouTube channel. You'll also find a handy playlist with plenty of resources on the topic of regenerative organic agriculture. If you want to do any more, dig in. And that was a very intentional pun, but there's a lot on there. So go and have a look. So in type two 
housekeeping news. If you've been a regular listener to the show or even just following my podcast, Looking Sideways, you'll know that at the beginning of lockdown, I did a series of live broadcasts on Instagram, which were called Type 2 Live. And they went really well. I did them for about eight weeks. And then we uh, had a rest over the summer. Happy to report Type 2 Live is coming back. We'll be starting again in September. Going to do monthly from this point. So uh, you can follow me at We Look Sideways if you want to take care of those or support the show. Looking forward to that. Really good project, Type 2 Live, and I'm happy we're bringing it back. Um, as you probably know, I release new episodes of Type 2 every month or so. They appear in my usual Looking Sideways channel, which you can subscribe to, subscribe to even via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if it's your first time checking out what I do, it does happen. Make sure you get stuck into the back catalogue. Got 130 episodes of interviews with some of the biggest names in action sports and other related endeavours on there. You can sign up for my newsletter. You can read all the show notes. There's a lot of stuff on there, basically. www.wearelookingsideways.com if you want to find out more. All right. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Alex. I'll see you next time. Nice one.